you know, our first speaker today is, is Javon McCormick, but I, I, I was, when we were sitting down, we were kind of talking about like how I want to introduce him. And I said, you know, Javon, you know you're a legit speaker presenter when two different chairs of GOT try to bring you in and don't know that they're bringing you in. So Mike Maddock had actually was scheduled him to speak in 2020. I didn't know this. And then I had asked him separately. So he was asked by two different chairs unknowingly. When I talked to Mike, he said, he said we're, you know, we're getting prepared for the event. And Mike's like, yeah, you know, hey, there's this one speaker you really need to consider, Javon McCormick. I'm like, yeah, he's already on my list. <laughs> so, so that speaks, I think that speaks volumes about him. Uh, just a few accolades about Javon. You know, like I said, he's the CEO of Scribe Media. Um, and they're just doing some amazing things. You know, they're the number one place to work in Austin. Uh, the number, he was just rated, I saw this because I'm from Austin, the number one CEO of the year by Austin Business Times. Uh, they got rated the number one company culture in America by Fortune Magazine. And he just informed me this morning that he's currently Ernst & Young finalist for Entrepreneur of the Year. So we have, we have a player in the house. Um, interestingly enough, that's not what I asked him to talk about. None of that. So he's here to share with us his story, and I'm so proud to have him here. So let's give a huge GOT welcome to Javon McCormick. <laughs> oh, man. Thanks, dude. So I'm going to stand up here because yesterday when everyone was staying there, I couldn't see back there, so I'll, I'll, I'll stand up here. Um, if you got your phone, if you're talking, listen to this for a second, because I'm going to start off with a warning. So much of what you're going to hear is disturbing and graphic. So I want you to know what you're going into, because many a times I've walked out of a conference after speaking, and people have complained, well, they should have prepared us for that. So you've been prepared. All right? So <laughs> you, you know what, we, what you're going into. Uh, he said, belly of the beast. I'm taking you into the cave. So... I'm not supposed to be here. Statistically, assessment test, teachers, society, everyone said I'm not supposed to be here. No way in hell you'll get to where you are. I smiled when I heard Darius read off the, the credentials, if you will, because that damn sure wasn't supposed to be my life. So I'm gonna take you there and tell you how, how I got here. So I wanted to call this talk, Leadership Lessons from My Pimp Father, but Darius wouldn't let me. <laughs> so right there, that good looking kid, that's me. And that, that, uh, that guy right there, that is my dad. Darius wouldn't let me call this Leadership Lessons from My Pimp Father because he was worried these guys would show up. So those are real 1970s pimps. And I don't care what you say, you gotta love that guy right there in the pink shirt with the pink shoes that match. <laughs> Give a damn what you say, you gotta respect the shoes. And my man over there in all red, hat, suit, shoes, you gotta respect it. So, in uh, the guy in the middle, I promise he is not a pimp. Um, these guys, we were at my dad's funeral a few years ago, and my only regret from that funeral is there were about 30 pimps at this funeral. I'm talking lime green, sunshine yellow, <laughs> sherbet green, uh, and I, I would have liked to have had a picture with all of them. So that said, my dad was a legitimate pimp in the 1970s. Somewhere along the line, we've bastardized the term pimp. Pimp my ride, pimp my car. Now my dad was a real pimp. He put women on the street corner, they sold their bodies, my dad took every dollar. Along the way, he also fathered 23 children. The most he had by one woman was three. I'm one of 23. So when I say pimp, once you get the visual in here, but that was a pimp. You get out there and you get his money. And it wasn't nice. My dad was not a nice person. My dad, when he would pick me up sometimes, he had a uh, candy apple red Cadillac. 
Candy Apple Red on the outside, Candy Apple Red leather seats, Candy Apple Red carpet. My dad had a broom inside the carpet that when he got in, he dusted off his shoes before he put his feet on the carpet. You got in this car, you didn't move. Some of my greatest life lessons happened in that car. I always knew there were three things I could count on. I knew we were gonna go collect money from prostitutes. I knew there was a high probability that I was gonna be sexually molested by one of my dad's prostitutes. And I knew I was going to hear the story of the CEO of Budweiser. So one, my entrepreneur first journey came from my dad, where I learned business. Nine years old, I'm in the front seat of that Cadillac. We're driving around. We go up to the first prostitute to collect money. It's February, Dayton, Ohio. First lady slides up just a huge stack of cash through the window. And she says, hey, can I come in? I made my count. And my dad goes, no, girl, get back out there in the most loving way. You're on a roll. Keep it going. Get back out there. Hey, you know what? When I come back around, you can pick where we're going to dinner. Like that was a, a bonus. So we drive off. We go to the next lady. She slid through what seemed like $3. And my dad lost his shit. He called that woman every foul, derogatory word you can possibly think of. Get out there, get my money. When I come back, you better X, Y, Z. But he ended it with, don't be common. He would always say, don't be common. Now, when he was talking to the prostitutes, what he meant by that is, don't stand on that, that corner in a common way. Don't dress in a common way. And when you're in the bed, don't do things in a common way. But the lesson made it down to me and several of my other brothers and sisters. So for me, it's like, okay, don't be common, don't be common. Okay, gotta do things different. So we drove off. In my mind, nine years old, I thought to myself, hmm, I wonder if I could make more money in volume if I treated the prostitutes better. And they got to keep part of the money. So I'm nine. And I'm thinking, okay, I could scale this. Like, this, this could work. And then it hit me. I'm like, ooh, competition, okay. A lot of pimps are going to be mad at me because I'm going to take their women. And that was my first view into business, scale, and, and more importantly, putting people first. How do I treat the prostitutes better? That's what I started with. So second to this, on those rare occasions my dad did have me, uh, I was always on the move on not getting left with one of my dad's prostitutes. Six, seven, eight years old, this woman would force me to perform oral sex on her. When she did, if I didn't do it right, she would slap me in the face, punch me in the head, and tell me to do it right. Now, I share this joke now. Some people think it's tasteless. It's my story, my joke. Don't like it. Too damn bad. When she would punch me in the face and, and I was there and she would scream at me to do it right, I didn't know what do it right meant. I'm 50 years old. I know grown ass people that don't know what do it right means. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so at, at six, seven, eight years old, I damn sure didn't know what do it right means. But as I got older, I always look for what's the positive in a negative situation because I believe there's always one. Sometimes you got to dig through some shit to find that positive. The positive for me came in eight years old and I remember, okay, she punched me one good time and I remember making a commitment to myself. I am never going to be in a position where I don't know what to do. And that was the positive because the rest of my life, I always tried to make sure I knew exactly what to do. So the third thing I said that happens when I'm with my dad, my dad would teach us this amazing lesson that at the time, we didn't know it was a lesson. He would always say the only difference between me and the CEO of Budweiser is that, that government made his drug legal. I was like, what's that even mean? 
And he'd, he'd say it again. He'd say it to his friends. You know, the only difference is the government made his drug legal. There's no difference between us. And he'd go into the story of prohibition and how alcohol used to be illegal. And I'm like, oh, okay. And, and so, again, eight, nine, ten years old, you don't know what the hell he's talking about, but, but you're taking it in because all you ever heard about was the CEO of Budweiser. And I thought, like, damn, is he pissed off at this guy? <laughs> and, and so I kept that lesson with me. CEO of Budweiser, CEO of Budweiser. Okay, great. So my mom was an orphan. And when I say orphan, my mom was raised in a 1950s institutional orphanage where the kids were routinely beat, neglected, abused. I want you to picture this for a second. When my mom turned 17 years old, they gave her a small suitcase, $20, and said, good luck to you. She had never seen the outside of those four walls. She didn't know what a street light was. She didn't know what a telephone was. So imagine you're walking out of an institution, 17, there's the world, make it happen. Unfortunately for my mom, one of the first people she met was my quite a bit older, well-dressed, fast-talking father. So I look at this picture often, even now, and I smile. And I think to myself, okay, what was that scared girl thinking in that picture? Because you can look at the picture and you can just see the fear. Was she scared because she had no money? Was she scared because she had no family? Was she scared because that's an ugly ass baby she was holding? <laughs> so I'm gonna take you to how I came into the world. I don't know if all of you can see this, but I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through it. So, you know, uh, Darius just talked about this. So we live in an insane politically correct world right now. I, I, we weren't so politically correct back in the 70s. We told you right off the bat, I was a welfare baby. They put it on the bill. There it is, welfare. Gee, thanks. They also told you that she was a single unwed mother, M-I-S-S. -S. Single unwed, unwed mother Welfare baby. Here's the other piece I really want you to pay attention to. The last name, McCormick. That was my mom's last name. It's my last name. My mom got that name in the orphanage. We have no clue where, why, how. I walk around to this day with the last name McCormick. No clue where it comes from. And of course, I've always got some smart ass. Oh, are you related to the, the McCormick Spice family? And I'm like, well, fucking A if I am. <laughs> Can you please let them know? <laughs> like to get in on some of that. You know, if nothing else, you know, a year's supply of salt, something. The reason why I have my mom's last name is when she went into labor, my dad was nowhere to be found. My mom walked herself to the hospital. She didn't learn how to drive since she was 35. Damn sure couldn't afford a car. So when she gave birth to me, I was the only thing she had in the world. No family. Nothing. So she said, I'm going to give him my last name. So that's how I got this last name. I found this bill three, four years ago in an old suitcase. In fact, it was a suitcase my mom left the orphanage in. Still have it. And this was in perfect condition. You, you, when, when you grow up poor, you tend to save everything because you don't have shit. So you just save random shit, hospital bill. So I looked at it, and I'm like, oh, I know my mom didn't pay this bill. So I looked it up, one Wyoming street, Dayton, Ohio, damn hospital still there. So I went and got a cashier's check, and I mailed it in. Because I said, you know what? If nothing else, damn it, I paid my way into this world. <laughs> I, I <didn't. laughs> I appreciate that. So, it's uh, melted in, and I got to imagine, whoever opened it had to have said, what the fuck, you're a little late. <laughs> but, so, growing up mixed race in the 70s, I don't need to tell a lot of you in here, oh, that was not a good look. Black people didn't like me because I was half white. 
white people didn't like me because I was half black. I tell people all the time, especially now in the, the time we live in, people want to talk about race. I'm like, you want to fucking have a race conversation? Let me tell you when neither side want you. It's interesting, and many people don't realize this. I was born in 71. I barely made the cutoff. I wasn't even legally allowed to be born in this country until 1967. And many people have lost track that, oh shit, that's not that long ago. So my mom, what, what I went through, okay, it was rough. You know, you, you're called zebra, Oreo cookie, chocolate vanilla swirl, half breed. It was rough growing up. Not near as rough as what I watched my mom go through. My mom was constantly called nigger lover, nigger lover. We lived in public housing and we're coming home one day. As we get closer to our apartment, we notice all of our shit's on the curb. No clue why. And the manager comes running out and he gets up in my mom's face and he says, no nigger lovers can live here. Now here's what's crazy. Black people lived in the building, white people lived in the building. They didn't want mixed race. So we sat on the curb, all our belongings. Nowhere to go, no family, no money. I do not remember where we went, I was five. I just remember sitting there crying with my mom. Now I don't know how many of you in here remember these, if any. These are food stamps. Back in the 70s, it was paper money, food stamps. To get your allotment of food stamps, you usually had to go to some type of center and wait in line to, to get your free handout. Two massive gifts came from these food stamps for me. We were standing in line waiting for our handout, two, three hours, and an older white lady was standing in front of us. And she turned around, she looked at my mom, she looked down at me, she looked at my mom, and she spit in her face. Called her a nigger lover. Here's what was disturbing. Nobody said anything. Nobody came to my mom's rescue. Nobody intervened. My mom had to stand there humiliated. Spit dripping down her face, tears. She couldn't leave the line because she had to feed her mixed race son. To this day, I smile about it because I think to myself, okay, you're in the same broke ass line that we're in. What makes you any better just because you're white and I'm half black? You're as broke as we are. And, and even now I, I wonder why is it that we view each other the way we do sometimes? Because you were hungry, we were hungry. That was it. The gift that came from that moment was, I realized in that moment, wow, I'm mixed race. Everyone's not gonna like me, ever, because there's nothing you can do. And at eight years old, I remember saying to myself, okay, everyone's not gonna like me. Excuse my language, fuck them. Somebody in here right now may not like my shirt and sock combo, I don't give a fuck. Fact of the matter is, that was one of the greatest lessons because most of us don't learn that lesson until high school, college, God forbid, your first career. Oh my God, they don't like my hair. Oh my God, they don't like my eyes. Eight years old, I realized everyone's not going to like me. So I embraced it and I lived my life. But I always knew I don't care what you think about me, but at times I know it matters. And I always kept that divide. I don't care what you think about me, but I know at times it matters. The ugly side of these food stamps. My mom ended up facing prison time for welfare fraud because she was working and getting food stamps. So my mom decided she was gonna ship me down to Houston because my father had moved the pimp game down to Houston, Texas. Nine years old, this is what I show up to. The hourly rate, Surrey House Motel. We all know what goes down at the hourly rate motel. 
So I show up, and my dad's there with his prostitute and my six-month-old half-sister. Two days after I arrived, my dad and the prostitute said, hey, we'll be back. And they left me. I'm nine. And they left me with my six-month-old half-sister. What do all babies do the moment their parents leave? She starts crying. I'm nine years old. I don't know what to do. So I pick her up. Shh, it's okay. It's okay. And I'm starting to panic. We're 10 minutes into this. She's still crying. Okay. I don't know how to make a bottle. Okay, I don't know how to change a diaper. Shit, can babies eat? And I'm now, now the anxiety is kicking in. Like, what do, you, what do you do? What do you do? She's screaming. I'm crying. I'm confused. I threw my baby sister across the room. By the grace of God, she landed on the couch. The moment she left my fingers, I ran over and just thought to my, oh my God, what kind of monster throws a baby? I pick her up, she's screaming, I'm crying even more. And so many people think that's the worst part of the story. The worst part of the story is then the prostitute shows up and she tells me to get out and take my sister with me. Oh, because she's got a man, time to do work. So my baby sister's crying. She's got on nothing but a diaper. It's Houston, Texas. It's July. And we're walking around that parking lot in the sweltering heat and humidity of Houston, Texas. I want to go home. I've never been away from my mom this long. I'm scared. I don't know what the hell's going on. And more importantly, I am so angry with myself because I just made a commitment a year ago when that prostitute was forcing me to perform oral sex, I said, I will never be in a position where I don't know what to do. And here I was. I did not know what to do. So I'm pissed. I want to go home. I'm mad at my dad. I'm mad at the world. My mother ended up not going to prison. And I, and I got to share this part. Sometimes I do, sometimes I, I got to share this with you all. So here's how my mom ended up not going to prison. Um, the prosecuting attorney for the state, he liked two things, drugs and prostitutes. <laughs> Guess where he used to get them from? My dad. My dad tells him, hey, you put her in prison, because of course my dad did not want to be taking care of me. You put her in prison, I'm going to go public. So the attorney says, okay, she's got to leave the state. So my mom moves to Texas. Great. So my mom gets to Texas. By this time that she gets down there, my dad and this prostitute now have three children together. So my mom gets to Texas, and then one day my dad, out of nowhere, says, oh, you know what? I'm going to take you through River Oaks. If any of you have ever been to Houston, River Oaks is one of the most exclusive neighborhoods in America. So he drives me through here and doesn't say a word. But he showed me possibility. I had never seen houses this big. These houses were bigger than the public housing I lived in. And then to find out only one family lived here, like these houses, 10, 15, 25 million dollars. I'm like, this is amazing. And it was in that moment I said to myself, okay, I didn't know how, but I said, I'm going to have one of those one day. No clue how I was going to get there. Maybe I was going to scale the prostitution game. I don't know. <laughs> but I knew I was going to get there. My dad, shortly thereafter, my mom's living in, in Houston. I'm still living with my dad. My dad decides we're going to pack it up and we're going to go back up to Dayton. He's taking the pimp game back up to Dayton. Doesn't want to stay in Houston anymore. Here's the problem. We leave. No one told my mom. Gone. She doesn't know if I'm in L.A., Chicago, Miami. She has no clue where I am. My dad just, we, we took off. We get back to Dayton, Ohio. Two weeks after we get to Dayton, my dad says, hey, 
I'm going to England. And he leaves me with the prostitute, my three half brothers and sisters. What I've have, what have not shared with you thus far is this prostitute is a horrible, horrible heroin addict. My dad left on a Saturday. The prostitute left on Sunday, said she was going to get a pack of cigarettes. Sunday turned into Monday. Monday turned into Tuesday. Tuesday turned into Wednesday. It's February, Dayton, Ohio. I'm supposed to be in school, and no one knows we're here. Wednesday, I realize, oh, shit, we don't have any food. So I have to tell my four-year-old sister to babysit the three-year-old and the two-year-old so I can go down to the store and steal food. I'm walking down to the store stressed because I'm like, okay, if I get caught, what's going to happen to them? I get in the store, steal some food. I come back. I walk in the door. I see my two-year-old brother walking around, and it hits me. Oh, shit. We don't have any diapers. I'm like, okay, I can't steal diapers. Too big. So I'm like, all right, come here, man. I set him on the toilet. He's crying. I'm crying. And I look at him and say, hey, man. Until something comes out, this is how it's going down. That's how you learn to potty train. <laughs> I had thought about doing my kids the same way, but I did, we, we, we went a different route. <laughs> um, Wednesday turned into Thursday. Fast forward, she left for three weeks. I'm supposed to be in school. No one came looking for us. Nothing. The greatest stress I have ever faced in life. I don't give a damn about income statements, balance sheets, hiring. Uh, the greatest stress I've ever faced. Every hour I worried that they were going to disconnect the water or the electricity in February in Dayton, Ohio. We're either going to freeze or we're not going to have any water to be able to take a bath or flush the toilet. I used to sleep with the lights on, so if I woke up in the middle of the night, I could look, okay, good, good, they're still on. Every hour, I stressed and stressed and stressed. Oh, my God, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Three weeks later, a prostitute shows up. She walks in, and this is the mom of my, my half-brothers and sisters. So, of course, they're happy to see her, you know, hugs, joy. And after everything calms down, I walk up to her, all 12 years old of me, and I go, where the fuck have you been? She beat the shit out of me. And I say this respectfully, think Rodney King in the LAPD. Because I fell to the ground and she stomped my head, kicked me, punched me. I jumped up, went upstairs, jumped out of the window, ran away. I got brought back to this house and the second beating was worse than the first. God somehow intervened, and the next day, my uncle picked me up, told me, pack up some of your stuff. I'm going to take you over to another one of my dad's girlfriend's houses. So he takes me over there. It's a Monday. Sweet. Immediately, she has food. She buys me clothes. She gives me some lunch money. I'm like, oh, this shit is good. Like, some normalcy, some structure. Friday comes around. Oh, shit, she's an alcoholic. And I'm looking a little too much like my dad right now. She starts kicking my ass. I'm tired of getting beat at this point. I fight back. She calls the police. White lady, brown kid. Who you think is going to jail? I show up here. I have a kind request of each of you. Don't ever call it juvie. Don't ever call it juvenile detention. This shit is juvenile prison. It is prison for kids. The only difference is we're under 18. As a society, we've tried to lessen the blow and call it juvie, juvenile detention. No, that shit's prison. When they took me from that lady's house and they took me here, I got put in there for 23 hours in the dark. Solitary confinement, 12 years old. There's grown ass men in this room that couldn't do that. I was 12. I ended up being in and out of juvenile three different times. The last time I was in juvenile, 
the corrections officer, huge black guy, he comes up and he says, he gets down on one knee and he looks at me, he says, hey, let me tell you something. You come back in here again, you're going to man prison. I'm 50 years old and I don't fuck man prison. Uh -uh. I, man, man prison just doesn't sound right. That just doesn't sound like something I want to attend. That was a gift in itself. I never went back to juvenile. So I ended up getting reunited with my mom at age 15. So I, we, we were separated from nine to 15, six years. I get back with my mom, I'm age 15. You know, and that in itself was trying to, she hasn't had me since I was nine years old, now I'm 15, think you're a man, but I have done some manly shit. And, and just trying to put that back together was, was harsh. What was even harder is when she went to enroll me in school, the counselor said, okay, you're gonna be in these classes. And the counselor said a word that I had never heard before. She said, okay, you're 15, okay, you're gonna be in geometry. Yeah, all right. The fuck is geometry? <laughs> so they put me in these classes. Needless to say, six weeks later, comes around, I got all D's and F's. So they have me tested, and I take an assessment test. I'm on a fifth grade level. I'm 15 years old. So fast forward, graduation rolls around. Of course, I don't graduate. I had to go to summer school to get my GED. So I'm going to pause here for a second because I have definitely taken in the moment that it missed some shit. The guy with the GED is speaking at MIT. <laughs> 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 and then throw in CEO and I'm like, yeah, okay. Um, so I ended up getting my GED, came home. I was like, mom, mom, got my GED. I'm proud. My mom looks at me and she's like, great, you need to go get a job. You got two weeks or get out. What the fuck? Fine. We're living in San Antonio, Texas now. So I go out, I get my first job. I'm 18 years old. My first job was cleaning toilets. I clean toilets at a place called Po Folks. What's the significance about this restaurant is my mom and I growing up, we would always joke and say, we're so poor, we can't afford the O and the R. We're just Poe. So the odds that I would get my first job at Poe folks, I'm like, wow, okay, meant to be. The, the real moment in cleaning those toilets came for me. I came into work one day, and of course, it's a, it's a shitty job. And... <laughs> That was an easy joke. Um, but I looked at the toilets one day, and I said, okay, if this is my job, I'm going to be the best at it. No matter what I do in life, I'm going to be the best at it. Oddly enough, that lesson came from my dad. One day, he had me and several of my, my brothers, and he said, look here, I don't care what you do in life, be the best at it. If you are going to sweep the streets for a living, be the best street sweeper. And they could have given us a little more to aspire to, but the, me the message was sent. So I didn't want to clean toilets the rest, the rest of my career. So I started trying to apply for jobs. My mom was working at an insurance company, so I, I was blessed to have a little bit of insight, like, how, how's this work? What do I need to do? Resumes. This is back in uh, fax machines. Come on, you all remember fax machines. Uh, some of you remember thermal paper fax machines. Um, but... I'd fax it, I'd call, try to get on people's schedules. Could not get on anyone's calendar. I put this here because in the early 90s when I was trying to get a job, I was making calls like crazy. And I knew I had a work ethic. No one would take my call. One day, one incredibly nice white guy picks up the phone and he says, hey, I got a question. This is the first thing out of his mouth. How'd you get a black first name and an Irish last name? Now, most people would have found that offensive. I was like, holy shit, my last name's Irish? 
I was like, oh, shit. You know, I'm ready to call my mom. Like, mom, we're Irish. I, I have discovered where this shit comes from. Um, but when I hung up with him, it hit me. Oh, they're seeing my name, Javon. So my full name is Javon Thomas McCormick. So the following week, I said, I'm going by JT. That's where JT comes from. I'll be damned. Callbacks, appointments, calendar invites. All from my name. I'm going to pause it for a second. If you notice, Darius introduced me as Javon McCormick. Shortly after the George Floyd incident happened, the murder happened, I saw so much bullshit, fake ass virtue signaling. Blackout Tuesday on social media. What the hell does that do to progress anything? Then we were arguing over a syrup bottle. A syrup bottle. I'm like, this is ridiculous. But then I saw an article. And the article said that there are only three black Fortune 500 CEOs. I was like, really? So I went, looked at their names. Kenneth Frazier, Roger Ferguson, Marvin Ellison, and as a bonus, the wealthiest black man in America is named Robert Smith. <laughs> so I'm like, huh, three, four very ethnic free names. So I said to myself, okay, I'm not a Fortune 500 CEO, okay, but I've, I've done some things. I've got, got a little something going for myself. I said, I'm going to reclaim my name. I'm going to start going by Javon. And I didn't do it for me. I built my career as, as JT. But what I realized is I became part of the problem. I edited myself for corporate America so I could be accepted. I am now part of the problem. So I reclaim my name, Javon, for every Martavius, Laquanda, Ravante, Lucretia in America that can't get on a damn calendar that maybe one day you can show up in the business world and work next to a Javon and not just a JT. And that's why I reclaim my name. My mom ended up helping me get into the insurance company. I was a mailboy. Pushed my card around, I filed, but damn it, I was a good filer. Life-changing event happened at the insurance company. I'm walking past one day and I see a sign that says, free lunch and learn 401k. Hmm. Of course, all I saw was free lunch and learn. <laughs> it could have said free lunch and learn foot fungus. Shit. <laughs> all right, what, what time? So I'm pushing my cart and I pass this lady, her name was Margie. I go, Margie, where's conference room 401k? <laughs> Margie laughs. She goes, no, 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 no. That's what the free lunch and learn is about. I was like, oh, okay. I would embarrass, I'm, just, I'm gonna ask. Like, worst you can tell me is no. Maybe, fuck no, but what if you say yes? So I went to this free lunch and learn and I sat there and I heard two of the greatest words in the history of mankind. You could have electricity, you could have fire. Give me compound interest. <laughs> I taught myself how to make money in the stock market. I have made tens of millions of dollars in the stock market and I am still waiting for someone to come show up and take this shit. I'm like, this can't be real. You can put in a hundred, make two? A thousand to make 10? God bless America. So I taught myself how to make money in the, in the stock market. Didn't want to stay a mailboy, so I got into <laughs> something very skeezy payday loans. I ended up going to work for a gentleman who owned 450 payday loans throughout the country. I'll fast forward through the story. Uh, the way it, it even came about was I, I personal trained on the weekends and one of the guys I personal trained, he said, hey, you should come work for my dad. I was like, man, I have no clue what your dad does. I said, all I know is you guys have a big ass house and a lot of cars in front. Where I come from, that's a drug dealer. 
And he said, no, 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 promise my, my dad's not a drug dealer. <laughs> Little known to him, I'm like, same fucking difference. But <laughs> <laughs> so, so I go meet with his dad. His dad says, yeah, you should, come, you should come work for me. I'm like, okay. So his dad brings me on, and I was sold because all he had was a high school diploma. And he, he had started with one office. Now he had 450. So I'm like, oh, shit. Okay, I like it. I started back in this, this room, the, what was called the proofing department. And you sat there for eight, nine hours a day, and you checked deposit slips to computer printouts. That was it. Make sure everything lined up. So I sat there, and I'm, I'm about two months in. And I'm bored out of my mind. I'm like, this is stupid. I don't want to do this the rest of my life. So I go to the manager, and I say, hey, how many reports have been proofed in a day? What's the record? And she said, 42. OK. Driving home, I said, OK, tomorrow I'm smashing that record. I'm going to be the best. Came in, and I had a goal, 71, because that's the year I was born. 71. Knocked it out. Hit it. Next day, 72. About a week later, the owner of the company, he used to sit in the front. And I'm t so this is Texas, Bernie, Texas. So this is a country white guy. He yells from the front. Now, my name is Javon. He yells out, Jovan. Hell, son, come here. I'm like, yes, sir. Come on, let's go in here. We go in his office. He goes, hell, son, you're killing it back there. Obviously, this is what, what you want to do for the rest of your life, isn't it? I was like, no, sir. Well, hell, what do you want to do? And he had this picture of him and the executive vice presidents behind him. And I looked at him. He asked me, I want to be in the picture. He goes, hell, son, you got a set of balls on you, don't you? You asked me what I wanted. All you can say is no. He goes, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you throughout the country. You go learn the, com the, the company, what we do, how we do it. So I developed a reputation of I'd go to these offices, and when they closed at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, I'd stay in the offices until 11 o'clock to teach myself the business. What do I do? How do I so I started turning around offices as, as I would travel throughout the country. He calls me in again one day. Hell, son, you're just out there killing it. Tell you what, I'm 23. I'm gonna make you a vice president. You got three places you can go. You wanna go to Shreveport, Las Vegas, or Portland, Oregon. So this is 1995. I had been in Shreveport, <laughs> but I had also been to Vegas, and I don't know how many of you have ever left the strip of Vegas, but that is some sad shit out in Vegas. It is, Vegas is not what you see on TV at all. I'll put it this way. He had seven offices alone in Vegas. So I'm like, eh, I don't want to live in Vegas. So he said, okay, go up to Portland, see if you like it. I had never been there. I get off the plane. I haven't left the airport and I called him up, Mr. Gentry, I want to move here. <laughs> And he goes, hell, son, you just got there, didn't you? I go, they have fresh air and trees. I want to move here. And again, this is 95. Portland was beautiful in 95. So he gives me this, this, this job. I go up there. I'm 23 years old. I got three offices that I'm overseeing. Everybody's in their 40s that, that's working with me. And so I'm just this kid that doesn't know anything. I'm there for a month. Mr. Gentry calls me up. Hell, son, how's it going up there? Oh, amazing, Mr. Gentry. You need anything from me? No, sir. Everything's good. He said, great. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go down to Eugene, Oregon. I want you to open a new office. Yes, sir. Hung up the phone. I walked back in my little office, and I thought to myself, where the fuck is Eugene, Oregon? And how do you open a new office? So I said, okay, first things first. Where's Eugene, Oregon? Drove to Eugene, Oregon. Got to Eugene. Oh, probably need to find an office space. Okay. Didn't know what a realtor was at, at that point, but I saw for lease, for lease, call this number. So, okay, call. So I found a, a realtor to, to help me. So they start showing me uh, offices. And then it hit me. I go, wait a minute. I've been throughout the whole damn country. All of our offices look exactly the same. This shit isn't hard. I got three that are identical in Portland. So then I set it up and I made it look just like the ones in Portland. 
I was in Portland for three years. I got there with three offices. I left with eight. I opened three additional on my own and I bought out two competitors. I sent Mr. Gentry the proposal to buy out the competitors. And he goes, son, who put this proposal together? I go, me? He goes, shit, I'll wire you the money right now. And, and so, and, and the reason I, I, I put the proposal together is I realized, and this is such a, a, a slimy business, um, all of the customers were borrowing from all the same offices. Well, these two competitors, they didn't sue the borrowers. In Portland, you can put a small claims judgment on, on an individual and garnish their wages. So I had mastered that in, in our offices. So what I did was, okay, these two competitors, they don't do that. There's a ton of money sitting in there. So my thought was do it in those offices, make even more money, be profitable. Killing it. 20, now at this point, I'm 26. Ton of money. And one day, a lady came in to make her payment. White lady. And she had a curly-haired, mixed little boy with her. Son of a bitch. It looked just like me and my mom. And in that moment, I was like, I'm out. I'm keeping people trapped. I mean, think about this. If you've got to borrow $50, how hard must things be if you've got to borrow $50? And how are you going to pay it back? And all I did was keep people in that cycle of renewing, 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 and you could never get out. And I didn't want anything to do with it anymore. So I called up Mr. Gentry. I said, I'm out. I'm leaving. I moved back to Texas, nothing, and I ended up going into an equally scary industry, mortgages. That's Angelo Mazzello, the godfather of Countrywide Home Loans. I got to work at Countrywide and built a hell of a career. If, if 2007, 8, 9 never happened, I'd still be in mortgages. I, CDOs, mortgage-backed securities, selling shit to Greece. My mom called me one day. She goes, hey, did you have anything to do with this? A little bit, a little bit. I was in on it. What was great about this? I, I had a hell of a career, made a ton of money. Mortgage crisis happened. I went broke. When I went broke, the greatest thing happened. I had to look in the mirror. I had made a ton of money couldn't hold a relationship to save my life. Character was horrible. I had to have an out loud conversation with myself. Out loud, not that shit where you look in the mirror and you're just thinking in your head, out loud. And I said the hardest thing that was for me to say, damn, you're just like your dad. I was a monster in relationships. Could not hold one. And I don't blame anybody. I had never seen my dad model a relationship. I had never seen anyone treat my mom with respect in a relationship. I just didn't know how but it was up to me to teach myself how. And in that moment, I said, okay. Had a lot of money, character shitty. Broke, character shitty. Matter of fact, I remember looking at myself and I said, okay, you know what? Hey, broke, what's up? I, I didn't think I'd be back here. How you doing? I go, I'm not staying long. I'm getting back out of here. I was okay being broke. I knew what that looked like, but I didn't know how to have a good character. Fast forward, I ended up working at a software company and I was the lowest paid person in the software company. Uh, I sat on a fold out metal chair, uh, made my calls. There were 13 of us. In two years, I became the president of that software company. We scaled that company from a storage closet to two offices in Austin, Houston, Dallas, and Monterey, Mexico. From there, I'm now the president and CEO of a publishing company. When my dad passed away, someone asked me, is there anything you would have liked your dad to have seen that you accomplished, your family, whatever? I was like, family? My dad didn't give a damn about family. So 2018 came around, and this came out. And I thought to myself, shit, I would have liked for him to see this. So I was on the cover of a CEO leadership magazine. So that's four-star General Petraeus up there, Heisman Trophy winner Bo Jackson, the hedge fund billionaire, Leon Cooperman, over in that bottom corner that at the time, that was JT McCormick. But get this one, above me, that's the CEO of Budweiser. (laughs) 
I am man enough to admit, I cried. I was like, Dad, that was well played. That was well played. Um, and, what, and what was crazy is, I, I got to share this with you all. My book came out in 2017, and I told the story of CEO of Budweiser in the book. It's in there in 2017. That was 2018, because a lot of people are like, no way. No, it, that, that was real. Um, look, all the money, all the growth, scale, companies, all, all that shit. It, it's been great. I love it. I embrace it. I, I'm very proud of it. Um, but my greatest accomplishment will, will forever be... That's my family right there. So um, I didn't repeat the cycle of my father. I got four kids. I take care of all of them. For whatever reason, they still want to eat each night. Um, but that's, that's my queen right there. They, I, I call them my royal family. So that's my queen, the little gentleman on the side of me right there. That's the uh, Prince Jackson, the little girl in front of me. That's Princess Ava, the little girl that's laying down did just said she was going to take the picture however the fuck she wanted. Uh, that is the Duchess L. But my man that my wife is holding, my man right there, that's Jace. We call him FJ. FJ will run around butt-ass naked. FJ will climb on the chandelier. FJ will do what FJ wants to do. So we call him FJ because it's like, fucking Jace. <laughs> So one day we are going to have to explain to him why we call him FJ. <laughs> what I get a kick out of, though, is if you look at my daughter in front of me there, I, I tell people, I said, yeah, when I had my kids, I used all my color on the first one. Um, <laughs> because if, if you look at my boys, Jace looks like he's going to run for the governor of, of Montana. <laughs> Jackson's going for Kansas. And, and so, yeah, that's, that's, that's my, my, my family there. Um, I'm going to close out here because Darius is telling me to get the hell off, off of off the, the stage, if you will. Um, I shared this with Darius this, this morning. My mother recently passed away. And when I say recently, many of you in this room would say to yourself, why the hell are you here that recently? And I shared with Darius, I said, I'm here because I made a commitment. And one of the big things that I do in life is follow through. And out of just, I don't believe in coincidence, but how this happened, I, I, I'm still working through. My dad died when I was doing my first book. My mom died when I was doing the second one. I feel like there's a part of, there are chapters that I needed to close in my life in order to move on. But my mom, unbeknown to me, the attorney gave me an envelope, and please allow me to, to read this to you. The attorney gave me an envelope, and here's what was inside the envelope. She was always proud that I can't tell you an adverb from an adjective, but I'm the CEO of a publishing company. <laughs> God knows, I can't spell. Thank God for the man or woman that created spell check. I'm still trying to meet them. But my mom was always proud that I, I did what I did in publishing. When I opened this envelope, this is what, what she left for me. She says, son, now that I, my time has passed, when I look back on my life, I know my only accomplishment in life was that I had you. In honor of you, son, and all that you've accomplished in book publishing, here's my obituary. I, Anna Marie McCormick Stark, turned the last page of my book on my life. Some chapters are glorious. Some hold deep sorrows and disappointments. Many times I do not want to finish my book at all. However, as I write the last chapter, it is filled with the deepest gratitude, unparalleled love, joy, and peace. My son, Javon Thomas McCormick, my daughter-in-law, Megan Ann McCormick, and my four grandchildren, Ava, Jackson, Elle, and Jace, as well as my husband, EJ, will know my love for them is unceasing. Here's where she got me. Everyone has a story. So as it should be, I leave nothing unsaid 
no chapters unread. Please do not judge my story by the chapter you walked in on. Today I close my book. Thank you all.